Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Beach House 34 True Crime Podcast. I'm your host, Christine Wirth. And first of all, I want to say welcome to all of the new subscribers. I'm so glad to see you here. Today, this is the reading of the trial testimony for Darley Routier, Part 4. Now, we are still on day two of the trial, which occurred on January 7th, 1997. And before we get too much further, uh, if you're enjoying these episodes, don't forget to subscribe through your favorite podcast service or like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube. It not only helps this channel get seen more often, you'll also be informed of all the new upcoming episodes. If you've been listening up to this point, you know the background behind the story, so I won't repeat it here, mainly to save time. If you are interested in hearing the whole background, you can listen to the entire Darley story, which started as a three-part episode and then went into her hearing to hold her without bond, and then finally the actual jury trial, which is where we're at now. I'll have all of the links in the show notes for you if you want to go back and listen. Up to this point, we've heard the opening statements and testimony from Dr. Joni McLean, who performed the autopsy on Devin Routier, the older of the two boys, Dr. Janice Townsend Parchman, who performed the autopsy on Damon Routier, the younger of the boys, testimony from a neighbor named William Gorsuch, and testimony from the first officer on the scene, David Waddell. And to give you an overview of the players, I'll quickly go over some of the names so that you're familiar with them. Now, the prosecuting attorney is Assistant District Attorney Greg Davis. He's been on the case since day one. He has a team of four additional attorneys. And so far, for the most part, it's been Mr. Davis who's been asking the questions. But whenever the prosecutor asking the questions does change, I'll let you know. Next, we have the defense attorney, Doug Mulder. He had limited time to prepare for this case when Darley's mother decided to seek out new counsel for her shortly before the trial began. Now, Mr. Mulder has a team of three attorneys. And again, Mulder is usually the one asking the questions. But if this changes, I'll definitely let you know. As in the last episode, I may have a few opinions, I might not. We'll have to see what this second officer to the scene says. As usual, this is my first time reading this through as well. So at least at this point, we're all in this together. With all of that said, let's get this second day started again, but this time with the trial testimony of the second officer on the scene, Lieutenant Matthew Walling. The questioning begins with the prosecuting attorney, Mr. Greg Davis. Sir, would you please tell us your full name? James Matthew Walling, W-A-L-L-I-N-G. Okay, Mr. Walling, how are you employed? I'm a lieutenant with the Rowlett Police Department. All right. Were you recently promoted to the position of lieutenant? Yes, sir, I was. Okay, When did that promotion occur? On January the 2nd. All right. And prior to that, were you a sergeant with the Rowlett Police Department? Yes, sir, I was. How old a man are you? 33. Are you married? No, sir. Do you have any children? No, sir. How long had, how long have you been a Rowlett Police Officer? A little over 10 years. Let me direct your attention back to it's going on, going to be the evening of June 5th, 1996. Were you on duty that evening? Yes, sir, I was. And what were your responsibilities that evening? I was a patrol sergeant for Deep Nights. Officer Waddell just testified. Were you his supervisor that evening? Yes, sir, I was. How many patrol officers were you supervising? Myself and five. Do you remember what time you came on duty that evening? At approximately 9.30. Now, did you actually go out on patrol yourself? Yes, sir, I did. 
Were you in a marked patrol car? Yes, sir. Were you also wearing a uniform like you're wearing this afternoon? Yes, sir. I want to direct your attention, Lieutenant, to approximately 2.30 a.m. on June the 6th, 1996, and ask you where you were at that time. I was approximately in the 5,000 block of State Highway 66 in Rowlett on the west side of town. Okay. Are you familiar with where the Victory Baptist Church is there in Rowlett? Yes, sir, I am. Is that also on Highway 66? Yes, sir. Now, Liberty Grove Road and Highway 66, would that be east or west of that location? That would be west of that location. Do you know about how far west of that church that would be? A little over a mile. Now, at about 2.30 a.m., did you receive a call over your radio? Yes, sir, I did. What was the nature of that call? It was regarding a stabbing. And who was calling you on the radio? It was a communications officer, Janice Bloom. All right. She worked for the Rowlett Police Department? Yes, sir. And what were you informed of at that time? That there had been a stabbing at 5801 Eagle Drive and that the Rowlett Fire Department ambulances had been dispatched. All right. Did you then proceed to go to 5801 Eagle Drive? Yes, sir, I did. Can you tell the members of the jury how far it is from Liberty Grove and 66 to 5801 Eagle Drive? It's about 3.1 miles. All right. And how long did it take for you to get from your location to 5801 Eagle Drive? Approximately three to five minutes. Now, on the way over there, Lieutenant, did you see any vehicles speeding away from, what is it, Delrock Heights? Is that the neighborhood where 5801 is? Yes, sir, it is. Did you see any vehicles leaving that neighborhood at a high rate of speed? No, sir, I didn't. Did you see any persons on foot while you were going over to 5801 Eagle Drive? No, sir. Do you remember how you came into that neighborhood? What street that you came in on? Yes, sir. I turned in on Willowbrook and I was behind the ambulance 902. So that would have been one of the ambulances that was sent by the Rowlett Fire Department. Is that right? Yes, sir. That was the first ambulance. So y'all came in the neighborhood uh, about the same time. Yes, sir. As you were coming in the neighborhood, Lieutenant, besides the emergency vehicle that you've just told us about, did you see any other vehicles driving around that neighborhood? No, sir. Did you see any persons on foot as you came into that neighborhood? No, sir. Did you then go to the house? Yes, sir. And where exactly did you park in relationship to that house? I parked on the northwest side of the lot of the house at the entrance to the alley running behind the house. Lieutenant, if you'll step down, please, with the court's permission. And then the court then says, yes, sir, you may do so. And whereupon the witness stepped down from the witness stand and approached the jury rail and the proceedings were resumed as follows. Lieutenant, if you'll use this pointer, please, and just show the members of the jury where you parked your vehicle when you came up there. I partially pulled into the alley and parked it right here. All right. Did you see any other police vehicles when you got there? Yes, sir. Officer Waddell's vehicle was in this area right around here. Okay. So you came over there closer to the alleyway. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. Thank you. Whereupon the witness resumed the witness stand and the proceedings were resumed on the record as follows. When you came up there near the alleyway, did you look down the alley? Yes, sir. I did. Did you see anybody? No, sir. Okay. How about Eagle Drive as it proceeds? I guess what's going to be west down here. Did you look down that portion of Eagle Drive? Yes, sir, I did. Did you see anybody down there? No, sir. What did you do then once you got your car parked? I exited the car, 
and came around the side of the house to the front. Did you actually come inside the house then? Yes, sir. I went through the front door and met with Officer Waddell in the living room area. If you would, again, step down with the court's permission, and the court then says, yes, go ahead. Whereupon, again, the witness stepped down from the witness stand and approached the jury rail, and the proceedings were resumed as follows. All right, Lieutenant. First, if you'll... I think you said that you had just come in the family room. Is that right? Yes, sir. Lieutenant, if you will... If you will just point out where you first saw Officer Waddell when you came in the family room. He was right about here, and he indicates on the photo. All right, and where was, did you see anyone else in the family room besides Officer Waddell? Yes, sir, Darren Routier and Darley Routier and the other child. All right, now, you referred to Darley Routier, Is that the female sitting over here at the table with the gray coat on? Yes, it is. All right. Your Honor, may the record please reflect that this witness has identified the defendant. And then the court says, yes, sir. Mr. Davis then asks, can you please point for the members of the jury where the defendant was when you first saw her? She was standing behind Officer Waddell, right along in here. Okay, And you had mentioned that you saw Darren Routier, the husband. Please point out for the members of the jury where he was. He was standing beside her. Okay, so you've got the officer, the defendant, and her husband are all in this area. Is that correct? Yes, sir. The officer was closer up here. Okay, you say that you saw a child. Which child are you talking about? There was one child laying approximately here and then one in front of the TV over here. Okay, now what is the first thing that you did then? When you came in, you saw these individuals. Tell the members of the jury, what's the first thing that you did? I first asked Officer Waddell to give me a quick rundown or what had happened. And at that time, he told me that somebody had broken into the house and that he had been told that a person had left through the garage area and may possibly still be in the garage area. All right, what did you do then? At that time, Officer Waddell and I went over to the garage area to search it. With the pointer again, would you please describe for the members of the jury the route that you took from the family room to investigate the garage. Yes, sir. We went right through here, through the utility room door, up to the garage door. I opened the garage door and stepped into the garage. Okay. Did I understand you to say, did you go on what I am calling the bottom portion of the, is this an island there that is in the kitchen? Yes, sir. Did you go below that to get to the garage? Yes, sir. Okay. Are you sure you didn't go this way, which would have been between the island and the sink in order to get to the garage? Yes, sir. I'm positive. As you're going through the kitchen, Lieutenant, did you see anything on the floor over here between the island and I believe it's the pantry? Is it over here? Yes, sir. Did you see anything on the floor in that area? There was a broken wine glass here and a little bit of blood. Okay, how about over in this area? Were you looking in this area over here, which is going to be on the other side of the island? And I believe in the area of the sink. Were you looking over there? No, sir, I didn't pay very much attention to that area. All right. Do you know whether or not there was anything over here lying on the floor or standing up in this area? There was a vacuum cleaner. I don't know if I saw it when I initially went through, but there was a vacuum cleaner there. All right. You said, did you go through this area? Is that correct? Yes, sir. Is there a doorway between the kitchen and the utility room? Yes, sir, there is. Okay, when you went through there, was it open or was it closed? It was open. Was a light on in the kitchen? Yes, sir. How about the utility room light? Was it on or off? 
I don't recall if it was on or off. Is there also a door that leads from the utility room into the garage? Yes, sir. All right. When you first got to it, was it open or was it closed? It was closed, but not all the way closed. It was pushed shut, but it wasn't latched. All right. Did it have a lock on it? Yes, sir, it did. Did you see, did you notice anything unusual about the door? There was blood on the door. And on what portion of the door was the blood? Around the door handle, up and down around the door handle. Okay, I guess kind of on the side of the door, on the facing. Yes, sir. Okay, could you see any defects in the door, such as signs that it had been broken, torn into, anything of that order? No, sir. When you looked at that door, did you see any evidence that there had been forced entry through that door leading from the garage into the utility room? No, sir, there was not. Okay, I believe that you just said that you stepped into the garage. Yes, sir, I did. All right. When you stepped in there, was the light on in the garage? I don't recall if it was or not. All right. Did you have a flashlight with you? Yes, sir, I did. How far into the garage did you go? A couple of feet. All right. And what did you do once you stepped in a couple of feet? I cleared the garage, looked back over here, looked over here to see if there was anybody in there. I looked over this way. There was a refrigerator here. And when I looked on the other side of the refrigerator and I noticed that the window screen had been cut. Is there a door to that garage, an overhead door? Yes, sir, there is. All right. Where is that located? It's located at the back here. Did you notice whether or not that garage door was open or closed? It was closed. Are there a number of windows on this wall here? Yes, sir. Did you see anything wrong with any of the other windows? No, sir, I didn't. Which window was it where you saw the screen cut? It was this window. Okay. You're referring to this one here? Yes, sir. Okay. Did you go over to the window to inspect it closer at that time? No, sir, I did not. Not from the inside of the garage. Okay, why not? With the window being cut, I was making the assumption that he had left out that way, possibly. So I was going to get around to the backyard as quick as I could. Now, was Officer Waddell in the garage with you or did he remain behind you? He covered me. He was behind me. I'm not sure how far into the garage that he went. Okay. Now, when you were finished clearing the garage here and you had seen the window cut here, what did you do at that point? We both exited the garage and came back through the utility room into the kitchen area. I left through the house, through the dining room area, looking and clearing it as I left to make sure there wasn't anybody there. I came over here and did a quick search of that, then went out the front door and around to the backyard. Is that why you took a different route out of the house? Yes, sir. When you looked in the nook, did you see anything unusual? No, sir. When you looked in the formal dining area, did you notice anything unusual at that time? No, sir. How about the formal living room? Anything unusual about it as you left the house there? No, sir. Now, when you left the house, Lieutenant, where did you go to? I went around the front the same way that I had come into the backyard, to the back driveway, and to the gate leading into the backyard. Whereupon, the following mentioned items were marked for identification only as state's exhibits 13 and it's dash A through E, after which time the proceedings were resumed on the record. Okay, Lieutenant, let me show you what I have marked as states exhibits 13, 13 A, B, C, D, and E. Do you recognize these photographs? Yes, sir, I do. First of all, states exhibit number 13. Is that a true and accurate aerial photograph of 5801 Eagle Drive? Yes, sir, it is. 
and states exhibits 13-A, 13-B, 13-C, 13-D, and 13-E, do they truly and accurately depict the backyard of 5801 Eagle Drive as it appeared on June 6th, 1996? Yes, sir, they do. Your Honor, at this time, we'll offer states exhibits 13 through E at this time. And the defense attorney, Mr. Mosty, says no objection. The court says all states exhibits offered are admitted. Lieutenant, again, now, as we're looking here at these photographs, this backyard that you said you came around, did you come around? Which way did you go around? Did you go around this way to get to the backyard or did you go around this way? I went around this way, back around by where I had parked my car and up here, up the driveway to the back gate. Is there a fence around this backyard? Yes, sir, there is. Okay, describe what kind of fence it is. It's a wood picket fence painted white. All right. Do you know about how tall it is? Approximately six feet. Okay. Did it have a gate to it? Yes, sir, it did. And with the pointer, would you just show us where that gate's located on the aerial photograph? Right there? Right there next to that garage door. Okay. When you got back around there, did you go immediately into the backyard or did you wait? I slowed my pace just a few seconds. About the time I was coming around into the driveway, another officer had pulled up. I motioned to him to follow me, to come into the backyard with me to help me to search. What's his name? Officer D. Moore, Darcel Moore. All right. And did he then join you up here? Yes, sir, he did. Now, the gate that you told us about that leads into this backyard, did you notice whether or not it was open or was it closed? It was closed. Okay. How did you get into the backyard then? It was latched, but there was not a lock on it. I lifted up the latch and used the handle to push it open. It rubbed. It wouldn't open when I first pushed on it, so I had to use my foot at the bottom of the gate to apply pressure and ended up shoving it open. Was the bottom dragging on the ground then? Yes, sir. So was it difficult for you to open that? Yes, sir, it was. All right. And the pressure that you put on there, did I understand you to say it was toward the bottom portion as you pushed the gate open? Yes, sir. All right. Did you actually then go into the backyard? Yes, sir. I did. Now, did Officer Moore accompany you into the backyard? Yes, sir. If you would, please tell the members of the jury what you saw as you first got in there and what did you do? When I first entered the backyard, I saw there was a spa house, a spa there. I looked back over at first to where to get my bearings on where the window was that had been cut in the garage. When I saw that, I went on in and started to do a search of the backyard, looking around for things that were covered by my view. I went around past the spa house and checked on the side of it looked around the corner of the yard, the backyard, to where it wraps back around toward the front yard. And after doing that, I came back and I entered the spa and I did a search of the spa. All right. When you first came into the backyard, Lieutenant, were any lights on in the backyard? No, sir, there weren't. At any time that you were in the backyard, did a light come on? Yes, sir. About the time I was walking in front of the spa, a motion sensor light that was mounted on the spa came on. Okay, now I put my pointer on a wooden object here. Is that the wooden spa that you're talking about there? Yes, sir, it is. Okay, and do I understand you to say that as you walked past that, the light came on? Yes, sir. How long did you stay in the backyard before exiting the backyard? approximately one to two minutes. Did the light, did this motion sensor light, did it go off before you had actually left the backyard? No, sir, it didn't. It was still on. Yes, sir. Now, if we could 
Is there also, I guess, well, is there a fish pond or something in the backyard also? Yes, sir. If we could, let's start looking at States Exhibits 13-A and 13-B. And if you would, what does States Exhibit 13-A show us? That's a photograph of the window with the screen cut. Then immediately outside the window, there's a couple of plastic chairs, a child's toy, and another plastic chair that is overturned. All right. Am I pointing at the window that you're referring to where the screen was cut? Yes, sir. Is this the same screen that you had seen from inside the garage? Yes, sir, it is. All right. And are these two plastic chairs that you're referring to here by the window? Yes. Okay. When you saw them that evening, obviously these photographs were taken during the daytime, right? Yes, sir. You're looking at this during the night, right? These two chairs, were they still in the same position, upright position, when you first saw them at approximately, what, 235, 240, somewhere in there? Yes, sir, they were. All right. How about this chair over here that's been overturned? Was it down in this same position when you first saw it? Yes, sir, it was. What is this? It looks like, what, a child's soccer goal or something? Yes, sir. Was it still upright in this same position when you saw it there that morning? Yes, sir, it was. Can you tell us what this light blue object is here beside one of these chairs? What does that appear to be? I believe that's a food dish, but I'm not positive. Now, if you were to look at this and continue to the right... Would we come to the sliding glass door that leads into the family room? Yes, sir. Is that what's shown on States Exhibit 13-B? Yes, sir, it is. Okay, Lieutenant. When you're in the backyard and you're examining this window, could you tell whether or not there was any light coming from the family room? Yes, sir, there was. All right. And could you determine what kind of light was coming out of that family room? You could see the reflection from the TV through the blinds, through the slats. The openness in the blinds and the interior lights were on also at that time. All right. Is that visible to you as you stood out here outside the home? Yes, sir, it is. Okay. When you looked at the sliding glass door... Did you see any evidence of forced entry here? No, sir. As we look at States Exhibit 13-C, are we really continuing 13-A to the left toward the gate? Is that the direction we're looking? Yes, sir. In fact, do we see an open gate here? Yes, sir. Is that the gate that you entered through to get to the backyard? Yes, sir. It is. Are there additional windows to the garage shown in States Exhibit in 13-C? Yes, sir. Two additional windows. Okay. What are these objects? What are these long objects here at the side of the gate? Those are fence posts or gate posts that haven't been cut even with the fence yet. This gate... Does it open? Is it a gate where you push it in or do you pull it out? It goes from the outside, standing outside, and you push it in into the backyard. Is it fair to say that in 13-C, we see that it's been pushed in an open position? Yes, sir. The fence and the gate, are they painted a color? They're painted white. And do we see a portion of the fence and the gate painted white in 13-C? Yes, sir. Okay. 13-D. What portion of the backyard are we looking at there? That's also the back gate and it has part of the spa in it. And States Exhibit 13-E, finally. What portion of the backyard are we looking at there? That's the other side of the spa, and it shows the far southwest corner of the backyard. Okay, let me ask you. The time that you were in this backyard, Lieutenant, did you see anyone in this backyard besides yourself and Officer Moore? No, sir. 
Did you hear anything unusual as you went into this backyard, sir? No, sir. Now, did I understand you to say that you actually went into this spa? Yes, sir, I did. Whereupon, the following mentioned items were marked for identification only as States Exhibit 14-A, B, and C, after which time the proceedings were resumed on the record. Okay, Lieutenant, let me show you what's been marked as States Exhibits 14-A-B and C. Do you recognize these to be true and accurate depictions of the interior of the Redwood Spa as it appeared on June 6th of 1996? Yes, sir, they are. Your Honor, at this time, we'll offer States Exhibits 14-A through C. Mr. Mosty says no objection. The court then says the state's exhibits 14-A, B, and C are admitted. Lieutenant Walling, if we first look at, well, just tell us, what did you see when you came in the spa that evening? There was the, I flipped the lights on, which the switch was right beside the door. There was the spa itself that was in the center of the room. There was a bar area, TV, TV set, and a stereo. In States Exhibit 14-A, do we see the stereo system here? Yes, sir. In 14-B, do we see a portion of the stereo and a portion of the hot tub itself? Yes, sir. And what do we see in States Exhibit 14-C? A television set that was sitting on the bar in the corner. Okay, Do you recall whether or not the door to the spa was open or was it closed? It was closed. Did you have to open it yourself to get in there? Yes, sir, I did. Sir, did you see any sign at all that anything had been disturbed inside this Redwood spa when you went in there that morning? No, sir. All right, Lieutenant. You have now cleared the backyard. You've cleared the Redwood spa. Could you tell us what is the next thing that you did once you finished up with this backyard area? Exited the backyard. I instructed Officer Moore to start a search of the neighborhood for suspects. I went around, back around the front of the residence, met up with Officer Waddell again, and we did a search of the upstairs of the residence. And do you know approximately how many rooms are upstairs in that residence? Three bedrooms, I believe three bedrooms and an extra living area or a game room and bathrooms. Whereupon the exhibits were marked for identification only as states exhibits numbers 16-A through F, after which the proceedings resumed as follows. All right, Lieutenant, let me show you what's been marked as states exhibits 16-A through F. Do you recognize these photographs to be true and accurate depictions of the the portion of the upstairs rooms as they appeared on June 6th of 1996 at 5801 Eagle Drive? Yes, sir. Your Honor, at this time, we'll offer States Exhibits 16-A through F. Mr. Mosty says no objection. The court says States Exhibits 16-A through F are admitted, whereupon the proceedings were resumed. If we could, first looking at States Exhibits 16-A through C, can you tell us which room these photographs depict, sir? That's the upstairs, what I call the game room area. All right. And these items up on the wall that we see here in 16-A, can you tell us what those are, Those are collectibles, like autographs, and I believe there were some cards there also, like baseball cards. I'm not sure about that, but they were famous people's autographs. This photograph in 16-B, is that Sammy Davis Jr.? Yes, sir, it is. Okay, do you recognize the other photograph below that, who, who that is? I believe that's the defendant. I'm not positive. Okay. The other equipment, the other items shown here in 16-B, what are those? It's a rack stereo system, speakers, and I believe those are CDs. Looking at States Exhibit 16-C, 
the large object on the left side of this photograph, what is that? That's a big screen TV. And the item on the right-hand portion of the photograph, 16-C, what's that? It's a computer system. Officer, as you come into this room, came into this room here, the playroom upstairs, did you find anything that appeared to be missing in this room, sir? No, sir. Did there appear to be anything that had been rifled through or moved in this playroom prior to you coming in there? No, sir. When you... Is this the first room that you cleared upstairs? Yes, sir, it is. What's the next room you cleared? Once you cleared the playroom here, what's the next room that you went into? The master bedroom. And in relationship to the playroom, where would it be located? Just out the door. And States Exhibit 16-D, tell us where... We are upstairs as we're looking at 16-D. You're looking, you're outside looking into the master bedroom. Master bedroom being here. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And would the playroom be to the right or to the left? To the left. So it would be over here. Is that right? Yes. This door leading into it? Yes, sir. Okay. What are we looking at over here on the right-hand side of the photograph? Some type of clock, I believe, and candlesticks. All right. And we're then looking in the doorway into the master bedroom. Is that right? Yes, sir. 16-E and 16-F, do they show different portions of that master bedroom? Yes, sir, they do. And just, if you could just orient us as to what we see in 16-E first. This is the bed, the dresser, the child's crib. All right. Did you find anybody in this room? Yes, sir. Approximately an eight-month-old child. All right. Where? She was in, or he was in, the crib. Okay, did you have an opportunity to look at him to see if he was okay or not? Yes, sir. When we entered the room, he was up on the side of the crib. Did he appear to have any injuries? No, sir. Did he appear to be having any sort of problems at all? No, sir. Did you take him with you at that point or did you leave him there? We left him in the crib. And why did you leave him there? We hadn't finished searching the rest of the upstairs. We knew that there wasn't any danger in that room. He was in the best place that he could be at the time. In 16-F, what do we see there? That's open. I guess you would call it a credenza with a television set in it. And then it looks off into the master bathroom. Okay, again, looking at this master bedroom... Did you find any evidence that anyone had been pulling open drawers, pulling out items, taking anything out of this room, sir? No, sir. Once you finished with the playroom and the master bedroom, where did you next go in the upstairs area? Went to the child's room. Okay. And the court then says, gentlemen, the jury has been sitting here for half an hour For an hour and a half, and I think we'll take a 10-minute break right now. So they take a 10-minute break, and when they come back, they resume the testimony. And when they resume, the state um, enters some exhibits, states exhibits 17-A, B, and C. And then Mr. Greg Davis continues with his questioning. Lieutenant, I believe we were at the point where you said that you were going to check the children's room. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. Let me ask you to look, please, at States Exhibits 17-A, B, and C. Do these fairly and accurately depict the children's rooms as they appeared on June 6th, 1996? Yes, sir, they do. And Mr. Davis says, Your Honor, at this time, we'll offer states exhibits 17-A, B, and C. Mr. Mosty says, No objection. The court then says, All right, whereupon the items were admitted, and then testimony continued. Again, Lieutenant, if we could, just looking here at states exhibit 17-A, 
where are we in the upstairs portion of the house when we're looking? We're on the, I guess, the balcony. When you come up the stairs, you're on the landing just outside the game room and master bedroom looking towards the door. The master bedroom and the playroom would be on the left side here. Yes, sir. All right. So now we're looking on the other side of the landing over here. Is that right? Yes, sir. And we're still seeing the same clock and candelabra that we see in the other photograph. Is that right? Yes, sir. This room here in 17-A, what room is that? That's a child's room. All right. Did you find anything unusual in this room, sir? No, sir. Anything that appeared to have been taken out of place, thrown on the floor, or anything of that order? No, sir. Estates exhibits 17-B and C. Is that another child's room? Yes, sir, it is. And in relationship to this first child's room, would it be to the right past this bathroom area? Yes, sir. And in general, what was the condition of this child's room? At that time that we went in and did our search, there wasn't anything out of place. This bed was made up, though. So we see a multi-striped comforter here. Is that right? Yes, sir. And when you and Officer Waddell first came in there, the bottom bunk was made up just like the top bunk. Is that right? Yes, sir, it is. Is there something here on top of this top bunk? There's a child's toy rifle. All right. You didn't find... Did you find any real weapons in this room, sir? No, sir. Anything that appeared to be out of order here or appear to have been taken out or looked at or anything of that order? No, sir. Okay. Now, when you finished up with the two children's rooms, were there any other rooms to search upstairs? No, sir, just the bathroom. All right, so anything unusual here? No, sir. All right, so you finished up all upstairs. What did you and Officer Waddell do at that point then? We both came downstairs. At that point, I exited the house and got on my portable radio, and I had already previously called for some other units into the area. I started finding out their locations and assigning them job assignments. And I made a few more calls for crime scene. And, well, had you had an opportunity prior to going upstairs to actually, I think, did I understand you to say that you went through the nook, the dining room entryway, and you also looked into the living room? Is that right? Yes. At this point, some items were marked for identification only, and these were states exhibits 15-A through F, after which time the proceedings were resumed. Lieutenant, if you would, if you will now look at states exhibits 15-A through E, or sorry, through F, I'll ask you if they truly and accurately depict the dining room, the formal living room, the breakfast nook, and portions of the kitchen as they appeared on June 6, 1996. Yes, sir, they do. And Mr. Greg Davis again says, Your Honor, at this time, we'll offer the state's exhibits 15-A through F. Mr. Mosty says no objections, at which point the court says state's exhibits 15-A through F are admitted. Lieutenant, first, if we could look at state's exhibit 15-A, what room are we looking at here? That's the dining room. All right. And several items on the table here. Yes, sir. Did there appear to be anything out of place in the formal dining room when you looked at it that morning, sir? No, sir. It was the dishes were set. Everything is just like it is now. Okay. 15-B and 15-C. Which room does this show? That's the living room. Okay, do there appear to be anything missing or out of order in the formal living room when you looked at it that morning, sir? No, sir. States Exhibit 15-D. What room is that? That's the breakfast nook. All right, and what object is that on the left? Does it appear to be some sort of cabinet? Like a china cabinet or something like that. 
Did there appear to be anything missing or out of order in the breakfast nook area when you looked at it that morning? No, sir. States Exhibit 15-E. What room is that? That's the kitchen. Okay, and what portion of the kitchen are we looking at? That's the island counter. This is, correct? Yes. Is this going to be the same island right here? Yes, sir. Okay, and in States Exhibit 15-E, can you tell which end of the island that we're looking at? No, sir, I don't recall which end that is. All right. I think it's the end that you first come to when you're coming from the living room into there, but I'm not sure. Okay. Are there certain items up there on top of that island? Yes, sir, there are. Okay. It seems to be a red and black object here. Do you know what those are? It's a wallet and like a daytimer book. In what condition were those things? They were as they are in the picture, lying on top of each other. Did it appear that either of them had been opened? No, sir. Hides the day timer and the wallet there. Yes, sir. A set of car keys and a watch. All right. The darker object being the car keys. And then we see a gold watch. Is that right? Yes, sir. Were they in plain view that morning? Yes, sir. They were. States Exhibit 15-F. What portion of the kitchen are we looking at there? That's the countertop that separates the kitchen from the family room. Okay. This area right here? Yes, sir. Okay. And are there certain objects shown on top of this kitchen counter or kitchen bar? Yes, sir. Several rings. I believe a bracelet, maybe a couple of bracelets, I'm not sure if there's a necklace there or not. I didn't look at this close enough to see if it was a bracelet or a necklace. All right. And these items right here, the jewelry and the bracelets, the rings, the other bracelet right here. Were these items also out there in plain view where you could see them? Yes, sir. Let me just ask you, Lieutenant, in your search of the downstairs portion of the house and your search of the upstairs portion of the house, did you find any sign? that anyone had been in that room looking for property in any of those rooms, sir. No, sir. Now, let's go back, if we may. You've checked upstairs. You've gone outside. You've checked upstairs. You've come downstairs with Officer Waddell, correct? Yes, sir. And again, if you will, tell us what you did when you came downstairs after finishing the searching upstairs. When I came downstairs, I exited the residence into the front yard. And at that time, I got on my portable radio and called to find out where the additional units were that I asked to come over. I started assigning perimeter areas or different areas for them to set up and different areas for them to drive in attempt to locate the suspect. Also, I called for a crime scene unit I had my lieutenant notified, and I also attempted to arrange for a helicopter search and a canine unit. Okay, and were you successful in getting a canine unit out here? Yes, sir. How about the helicopters? No, sir. I contacted DPS Helicopter Division and was told that a helicopter was not successful for a night search in a neighborhood like that. Let me ask you, Lieutenant, whether at any time that evening that you came in contact with any vehicles driving along Eagle Drive? Yes, sir. Approximately during the time when I was on my radio in the front yard, a car came around from the side of the house towards the front of the house. Okay. We're now looking at States Exhibit number eight here, which is the aerial of the house. Can you use this pointer and just indicate for the members of the jury where you saw this car? I was right along in this area here and the vehicle was coming down here. And about when it got right along in here, I was in the street and I stopped it. All right. Can you tell us what kind of car it was? It was a dark colored sedan. All right. How many people were inside? I think there were four. All right. What did you do once you got the car stopped? 
Since at the time I had a suspect description, I ordered everybody out at gunpoint. All right. Let me just ask you, you said you had a suspect description, correct? Yes, sir. What was the suspect description that you had at the time that you stopped this vehicle? A white male wearing a dark colored ball cap, a black shirt and blue jeans. All right. You got the car stopped now. Just pick it up from that point, please. Yes, sir. I stopped the car. I had the occupants, which there were four, exit the car and place their hands along the hood of the car, at which time I identified them. All males or all females. There were two white males, one black male and one female. All right. You got everyone out. Yes, sir. How was the lighting out there at that location where you had these people out? It was pretty good. There was a street light nearby. All right. What did you do once you got them out? What did you have them do? I had them place their hands on the front of the car so that I could check them for weapons. I checked them for weapons and I checked the interior of the vehicle for anything relating to this crime. I identified them. Okay. Let me ask, did any of these people in this automobile, let's talk about the three males. That's what you were looking for. A male, correct? Yes, sir. White male. Any of the two white males then match the description that you had been given? No, sir. Both were wearing light colored shirts. Okay. Wearing light colored shirts? Yes, sir. Either of them wearing ball caps? No, sir. Did you look at the occupants to see whether you could see any blood on any of these occupants? Yes, sir. I looked individually at each one, made them show me their hands front and back. I looked up and down their clothes, checked their shoes by looking at them. What did you see? I didn't find anything. How about the outside of the vehicle? I examined it and I didn't find anything. All right. Did you look inside? the vehicle. Yes, sir. I did. Did you see any blood inside the car? No, sir. Okay. How about any clothing? Did you find any dark t-shirts, any ball caps, any other clothing inside the car? No, sir. I didn't. Okay. What did you do then? Once you finished the search of the occupants, you identified them and you completed the search of the vehicle. What did you do with them? I released them. All right. And once you released that vehicle, then let me just ask you, how long have you been out here at 5801 Eagle before you see this car coming down Eagle going, I suppose, east on Eagle? How long had you already been there by this time? It was approximately between 10 and 30 minutes. I'm not exactly sure. And that's how much time had passed before you stopped it? Yes, sir. After you had already searched them, you released the vehicle. What's the next thing that you did? I started stringing up crime scene tape, positioning the crime scene tape around the scene to keep any other vehicles out and to secure it from anybody walking up. All right. Now, where was Officer Waddell during the time that you're doing this? When I initially exited the house from the upstairs search, I told Officer Waddell to remain on the front door and not let anybody in the crime scene. Okay, let me just ask you, were there ambulances out here at 5801 Eagle? Yes, sir, there were. Had any of the ambulances left by the time you started stringing up the security tape? One had. All right. How about the others? Still there? I believe it was still there. All right. Officer Walling, I'm going to show you a clear overlay that's been marked as State's Exhibit 8A and ask you whether or not you see a red and yellow line on this overlay. Yes, sir. Is that a true and accurate depiction of where you strung the outside perimeter tape that morning? Yes, sir. The red line is. And do you see a single yellow line on this overlay also? Yes, sir. 
Is that an accurate depiction of another set of tape that you had strung later that morning on June 6th, 1996? Yes, sir, it is. At this point, Mr. Greg Davis then says, Your Honor, at this time, we'll offer State's Exhibit number 8-A. Mr. Mulder says no objection. The court then says State's Exhibit number 8-A is admitted, and then the questioning continues. And again, as we're looking here on this diagram, officer, the yellow and the red, when did you string that tape? Approximately 10 minutes after we arrived at the residence. All right. Is this the line that you're stringing while Officer Waddell is at the front door? Yes, sir, it is. Once this one got strung, were any vehicles allowed inside that perimeter? No, sir. What's the purpose of putting this line up? To keep vehicles, to preserve the integrity of the crime scene, to keep vehicles and persons on the other side of it from entering in. This single yellow line that we see around 5801 Eagle, what does it represent? It's the interior crime scene tape that was put up maybe an hour or two later. It condensed the crime scene area to the house itself and the yard. Okay, now if you know, how long did the outside perimeter remain up? Once you strung it there in the morning of June the 6th, do you know how long this outside perimeter remained there? It still remained up for several hours. All right. Into the later portions of June the 6th? Yes, sir. I believe so. All right. This inside perimeter with the single yellow line, was it removed on June 6th also? No, sir. It remained for several days. Several days? Was this area, did it remain secure for several days? Yes, sir. Approximately two weeks. All right. And during that period of time, this line was up, correct? Yes, sir. Were civilians allowed to enter through this tape during those several days that Rowlett continued to have possession of this house? No, sir. They weren't. In the photograph, can you see a vehicle here parked on the front portion of the house? Yes, sir. What is that? That's a Rowlett police car. An officer was stationed in this area each for 24 hours a day for every day that we held the crime scene. Do you know the last day that Rowlett actually had possession there? No, sir, I don't. Several days, though. Several days. Okay, officer. Once you completed stringing this outside perimeter, just tell us the next thing that you remember doing. I made several other transmissions or talking on the radio to the officers in the area to find out their status and where they were and see if they had found anything during the search. At one point, the defendant was sitting on the front porch. I went up and asked her if she could tell me what happened and talk to her for a few minutes. All right. Can you please tell the members of the jury what the defendant told you there that morning? She had told me she was asleep on the couch and that she had been awakened and felt somebody standing over her. Then she realized that she had been stabbed and she began struggling with the person and that they had ran out through the kitchen door into the garage. When And when she told you that she had to struggle with the individual, did she indicate to you that morning where the struggle had taken place? Yes, sir. At the couch. At the couch. Yes, sir. Are you sure that she didn't tell you that the struggle occurred between the kitchen and the family room? No, sir. She said that when she woke up, the person was standing over her and that she was lying on the couch and that she began struggling with him. Okay. And that he ran through the garage. Is that right? Yes, sir. Did she give you a description of that person at that time? Yes, sir. It was a white male wearing a dark colored ball cap, a black t-shirt and blue jeans. Okay. She didn't say it was either a black or white man. No, sir. She said it was a white male. And how long had you been at this residence when you had this conversation with the defendant? It was within probably within the first 10 minutes 
When I talked to her, it was prior to me stopping the car. All right, go ahead and have a seat back there. Uh, Whereupon the witness resumed the witness stand and proceedings were resumed on the record. Lieutenant Walling, let me ask you, once that area was taped off and once an officer was posted on that door, did you ever re-enter that house? Yes, sir, I did. And can you tell the members of the jury what time it was that you re-entered 5801 Eagle Drive? A few minutes after 6 o'clock that morning on June the 6th. All right. Was there still an officer posted on the front door when you entered the house? Yes, sir, there was. Do you remember his name by any chance? Officer Steve Ferry. Is he a member of the Rowlett Police Department? Yes, sir, he is. Had you given him any instructions or had anyone given him any instructions about sealing off that area? Yes, sir. He was told not to allow anybody into the residence. Do you know whether or not someone had been on the front door before Officer Ferry took over? Yes, sir. There was Officer Steve Wade. Is he also a member of the Rowlett Police Department? Yes, sir. He is. Had anyone given him instructions about limiting the access to that house? Yes, sir. And who had given him those instructions? I had. I advised him not to let anybody into the house unless he heard something from me. Okay. Now, at any time while Officer Waddell, Officer Wade, and Officer Ferry were on the front door, did you ever authorize them to let anyone in that house before you came into the house a little bit after 6 a.m. No, sir. When you went into the house there, officer, a little after 6 a.m., did anyone go into the house with you? Yes, sir. On my initial entry into the house, the routiers had a dog, a small dog, and we were concerned about it and wanted to get it out of the house. It was upstairs along the upstairs railing and it was barking. I entered the house. Officer David Main, a crime scene officer, entered the house. And a neighbor, I believe her name was Karen Neal, entered the house. Myself and Mrs. Neal went up the stairs and she picked up the dog and brought it out. She exited the house. All right. Let me ask you first, concerning the bottom portion of the house, the first floor, What area of the first floor did Miss Neal go to while she was with you? From the front door directly up the stairway. All right. So she went through the entry. Is that right? Yes, sir. To the stairs. Yes, sir. All right. Now, once she got up to the second floor, where did she go to? She was able to talk to the dog. The dog knew her and she picked it up right there on the landing. All right. Did she ever go into either the playroom, the master bedroom, the boys' bathroom, or the boys' bedroom? No, sir. Okay. Was she always in your sight while she was upstairs? Yes, sir, she was. And once she got the dog on the landing, where did she go to? We both walked back downstairs, and she exited the front door the same way she came. All right, now... When she came down the stairs, what portion of the first floor did she go to? Just directly from the landing of the stairs to the front door. Was Mrs. Neal always in your sight while she was going down the stairs and while she was exiting from the stairs out the front door? Yes, sir, she was. Do you know approximately how long Mrs. Neal was inside that house retrieving the dog? approximately 30 seconds to a minute. What kind of dog was this, if you know? It was a small dog. Okay, do you remember how he was acting? He was barking. Okay, now when Miss Neal exited the house, did you and Officer Maine leave with her or did you remain in the house? We remained right inside the doorway. At that time, Officer, I'm sorry, Sergeant Neighbors and Lieutenant Cron entered the house. David Neighbors, is he a sergeant with the Rowlett Police Department? Yes, sir, he is. And you referred to a Lieutenant Cron. Is he a retired lieutenant with the Dallas Sheriff's Office? Yes, sir, he is. Okay. And does he consult with Rowlett from time to time? Yes, sir. 
And did you accompany Sergeant Neighbors, Lieutenant Cron? And was David Main also with you? Yes. And David Main is who? He's a crime scene officer also. And did you and these other gentlemen go through the house again then? Yes, sir, we did. And did you go through all the bottom floors? Yes, sir. We, did you go, I'm sorry, I walked through and pointed out different things to them that I had seen when I was in the house, both upstairs and downstairs. Okay. And you went upstairs also then? Yes, sir. Did you have a chance to go to the backyard? Yes, sir. All right. And was Lieutenant Cron and David Neighbors and David Main also with you when you went back there? Yes, sir. Do you have any distant estimate of the amount of time that the four of y'all spent in the house making that initial walkthrough? Approximately 10 to 20 minutes. Okay. Now, at what time you were a sergeant? At what at that time you were a sergeant? Were you associated with the physical evidence section at Rowlett? No, sir, I wasn't. Were you in the patrol division then? Yes, sir. Sergeant Neighbors and David Main, they were assigned physical evidence. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Once y'all had made that initial walkthrough, did you kind of hand the baton off to them concerning the crime scene? Yes, sir, I did. Lieutenant Do you have any idea about how long you remained at the scene that day? I was there until approximately 1130. 1130 in the morning? Yes, sir. And at that time, did you then go back to the station? Yes, sir, I did. And did you prepare a report once you got back to the station? Yes, sir, I did. Okay. It was approximately 1030 to 1130 that I left. Okay. Now, while... You had been at the residence. Had you made any notes? Yes, sir, I had. And what notes had you made while you were out there before going back? The notes I took were when I was talking to the defendant and she gave me the physical description of the suspect. Okay, dark ball cap, correct? Yes, sir, white male, dark colored ball cap, black shirt, and blue jeans. Okay, Let me just ask you, you were out there from about 2.30 until about 11.30. Is that right? Yes, sir. Were you keeping track of the timeline of exactly when you would start doing something and when you would stop doing something? No, sir. Were you wearing a watch that night? Yes, sir, I was. Okay, but you weren't timing yourself. No, sir. Okay, the times that you and I have talked about, Would you consider them to be exact times or are they estimates or approximations? They're approximations. Okay. Mr. Greg Davis then asks the court, may I approach a moment? And the court says you may. He then continues, Lieutenant Walling, prior to your testifying today, did I ask you to tell me whether or not the sheets I'm holding before you represent the report that you prepared in this case, as well as a copy. It looks like a faxed copy of your whip out sheet. Yes, sir. Okay. Are they in fact your notes? Yes, sir. They are. Your honor, at this time, I'm going to tender to Mr. Mulder a copy of the whip out sheet and the report prepared by Lieutenant Walling, and I'll pass the witness for cross-examination. And the court then says, all right. Mr. Douglas Mulder, the defense attorney for Darley, then says, Judge, I'm going to need a minute to read this. And the court then says that will be fine. A short discussion was held off the record, at which point the court then says, all right, ladies and gentlemen, in view of the weather situation outside, it's unknown what they're speaking of. We're going to terminate the proceedings for today and we'll resume tomorrow morning at nine o'clock. The following morning, um, the jury comes back in and court then resumes. And at this point, it is the defense attorney for Darley that begins with the questioning. And Lieutenant Matt Walling resumed the stand as a witness. And Mr. Mulder then says, Lieutenant Walling, you understand, of course, that you are still under oath. Yes, sir. And you were, I believe, way back on Monday, placed under the rule of evidence. Yes, sir. 
you've heard that when the prosecutor asked that all the witnesses be placed under the rule of evidence, yes, sir. Of course, you haven't, I take it, then talked with the other witnesses about your testimony and no witness has discussed his testimony with you. No, sir. That's the purpose of the rule, isn't it? Yes, sir, it is. So the witnesses don't get together and cook up a story, correct? Yes, sir. And of course, y'all didn't need to do that because you have had a, you kind of had a dress rehearsal, didn't you? Weren't you involved in the dress rehearsal with the district attorneys? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We had gotten together before. You got together in the courtroom? Yes, sir. And everybody kind of sat around and listened to the other witnesses as they went through their part of the testimony. Yes, sir. Okay, it looks better, I guess, for the conductor if everybody's on the same sheet of music, doesn't it? Yes, sir, I guess it does. But I mean, it helps you if you're able to, for example, and I'm not suggesting that you would change your testimony, but I mean, it helps to refresh your memory and it looks better if everybody's consistent, doesn't it? It makes sense? Well, it does refresh your memory. Yes, sir. And of course, it looks better if everybody's consistent, doesn't it? Well, sir, don't you think? Well, you don't know? Well, I'm talking as long as you tell the truth, it doesn't really matter. That's not what we're here for, is to make things look better. Well, let's just talk about about when you say, quote, as long as you tell the truth. Of course, you mean the whole truth, don't you? Yes, sir. And nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. And you've been under oath before in this matter and testified, have you not? Yes, sir, I have. And at that time, you took an oath to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, didn't you? Yes, sir. Okay, let me, Mr. Walling, Sergeant Walling, Lieutenant Walling, on the evening of or the early morning hours of June the 6th of 1996, you told us that you were on Highway 66 and got this dispatch. Is that right? Yes, sir. I believe your response time was something like two or three minutes. Is that fair to say? Approximately three minutes. Okay. At any rate, you were some, as I recall, some 3.1 miles away at that time, right? Approximately. Yes, sir. You were on Highway 66, which is a main artery through Rowlett, is it not? Yes, sir, it is. I have my finger on 66. It's this red thing? Yes, sir. And Mr. Mulder then turns towards the jurors and says, can you all see that? And the jurors then nod, yes. And now another artery that is close to Rowlett is Interstate 30, isn't it? Yes, sir, it is. Runs from Dallas basically to Texarkana, doesn't it? Yes, sir. It runs almost parallel, does it not? Yes, sir, it does. Big divided highway? Through Rowlett, it runs parallel. All right, and that's Interstate 30. Yes, sir. Of course, you were coming from the opposite direction, but somebody at 231 or 232, at or about the time that you got your dispatch, somebody could have gone down Dalrock Road to Interstate 30, and by the time you got to Eagle, been well on their way to Dallas if they had made a right turn. And yes, sir, that's correct. And through Rockwall, if they made a left turn. Yes, sir, that's correct. And that's a big divided. Is it four lanes on each side or in some places it is, I guess? Are you talking about Dalrock? No, we're talking about Del Rock is a main artery as well, is it not? Yes, sir. Okay. And on the interstate, of course, is a divided highway with several lanes on each side. Yes, sir. All right. Now, your response time is about three minutes, right? Yes, sir. Approximately. Okay. And you heard in the, a matter of fact, you were down here Sunday, were you not? In this very courtroom? Yes, sir. And you listened to the 911 tape and you realized from that that your patrolman, Officer Waddell, had been at the residence during the 911 call. Is that right? Yes, sir. 
Matter of fact, the officer, when she's told to let the officer in, that's you, isn't it? I'm assuming it is, but I don't believe the dispatcher knew that the officer, Officer Waddell, was in the house at the time. Well, at any rate, you arrived there shortly after that 911 call, didn't you? Yes, sir. And as I understand your testimony yesterday, you rendezvoused with Waddell to have him bring you up to date on what he knew at that point. Is that right? Yes, sir. And then without Darley, without talking to Darley or her husband, who were also present, weren't they? Yes, sir. As I understand your testimony yesterday, you and Waddell went and went directly to the garage. Is that right? After we talked? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. All right. And I believe that you said that your route to the garage. Sir, what are those first two words on that line right here? Yes, sir. It says met with. Okay. That's just a W slash. Okay. Met with Waddell and went directly to the garage. Yes, sir. And I think you said at that time you stepped into the garage, didn't remember whether the lights were on or not, had a flashlight with you, saw the window open with the screen cut. Is that right? Yes, sir. And satisfied yourself that there was no one there in the garage from your vantage point, which was just inside, as I understand your testimony. Y'all were just inside the garage, like you were right there and Waddell was covering your back, still standing in the utility room. I believe that he was a step or two in the garage. I'm not sure exactly where he was. I stepped in a couple of feet. There was, I believe it was either a refrigerator or a freezer or something. If you were standing in the doorway, looking into the garage to the left, to the left of me, and I had to go around it, to look around it, to see all the way to the wall. Well, at any rate, you satisfied yourself that there was no one in the garage and then you exited the garage and came out, as I understand your testimony, into the dining room. Yes, sir. You had gone in through the kitchen past the wine rack on this side of the island. Is that right? Yes, sir, it is. And I think you told the jury yesterday at that time you didn't see an overturned vacuum cleaner in this area. I don't recall seeing it at that time. And we can take that as a definite then that you did not see an overturned vacuum cleaner in this area at that time. I don't recall seeing it at that time. I remember seeing one there, but I don't remember whether or not if I noticed it the first time though, first time through, or when I went through later with the crime scene. Okay, would you quarrel with me? You've been over your testimony. Have you not your previous testimony? Yes, sir. Okay, you know that you testified back then that you did not see it when you initially went through the kitchen. Is there anything that's going to change that? No, sir. Okay, fair enough for me to write on here that Lieutenant Walling or Sergeant Walling at the time, Walling did not see vacuum cleaner when first went through kitchen. Is that fair? Sir, I don't recall seeing it at that time. All right. Walling does not recall seeing vacuum cleaner when first went through kitchen. Fair enough? Yes, sir. I don't remember if I actually saw it at that time or when I was in the house later. I don't remember when I first saw it. Well, just so that we don't, your memory would have been better in August than it is today, would it not? If it was that much closer? Well, on some things. Okay, well, I mean, we can go back and I can, if you prefer, let me hand you what has been marked for identification record purposes as defendant's exhibit number 15. And I'll ask you to just page through that briefly in the privacy of the witness box and tell me whether or not that is your, yes, sir, it is, prior sworn testimony. Yes, sir, it is. All right. Were you asked if you would turn to page 179, line 10? Were you asked, was the vacuum cleaner there in the kitchen when you went through the first time? And did you answer, no, sir, 
I don't remember at that going through. Yes, sir, I don't recall. That's what I'm telling you now, that I don't recall. You don't remember it when you went through it at that time. Is that fair to say? Yes, sir. All right. Now you went back in and made a thorough search of the residence, did you not? Yes, sir. Okay, but that was after you had gone out to the backyard. Is that not right? Yes, sir. Now, once you, of the upstairs, of the upstairs part, downstairs I searched on my way out to the backyard. Okay, you went through the dining room and living room? Yes, sir. Satisfied that there wasn't anybody there? Yes, sir. And then you searched outside. Is that right? Yes, sir. And so after, would it be fair to say that after you had searched the first floor, you then searched the backyard? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. And you have told us how you got into the backyard by opening the gate. And I think you showed us how you even had to push push a little bit with your foot on the gate to open it up. But you were able to open it up, weren't you? Yes, sir. I mean, you didn't have any trouble that wasn't a difficult maneuver, was it? Well, it was pretty hard to get it open. But you managed, didn't you? Yes, sir. And you're talking about a matter of seconds that it took you to... Yes, sir. All right. You told us yesterday that you didn't know whether the lights in the backyard were on or off at the time, didn't you? No, sir. Were the lights off? The lights in the backyard... Uh Uh-huh. Yes, sir. They were off. Okay. And when you walked from the gate of the backyard over to the window that you had seen from where you were in the garage, the lights did not come on, did they? Well, I didn't go there first. Okay. In fact, I walked first to the spa and past the spa and around the corner. I looked over at the window as I was going through. Did the lights ever go on? Yes, sir. While you were in the backyard. Yes, sir. The floodlights mounted on the spot did. All right. Those are motion detectors. Are they not? Yes, sir. Okay. Do you know where you were when you set the motion detector light off? I was approximately around the door of the spa. The door of the spa. Yes, sir. Okay. The spa is toward the back of the lot, is it not? Yes, sir, it is. And on this state's exhibit 8-A, this would represent the spa, I assume. Yes, sir. And you were back in here when you set the, when the light turned on? I would have to see a front view of the spa to see where the door was. Well, I don't, really don't remember. Right along in the center of the building. Yes, sir. And it would follow, would it not, that the door would be somewhere at the end of this cement sidewalk. Yes, sir. It didn't set the light off when you came in through the gate, did you? No, sir. Okay. Later on, some experiments were done. Were you there when those were done? Yes, sir. And you were able to, or the police officer conducting it, was able to run in this area to the window back and forth and not set off the alarm, set off the lights. Was he not? The only thing that I did when the light came on, I stayed out of or at the entrance to the yard. When the lights came on, I timed it to see how long they were on. Okay. Were you there when the experiment was conducted? Yes, sir, I was. Okay, well, you know then that he was able to walk from the window and run from the window, both run and walk from the window to the gate without setting off the light. I'm not sure what path he took. Okay. But you were there when that experiment was conducted. Yes, sir. I was, I timed it. Did you make any notes of that? Or did you just relay the timing to somebody? I just relayed it to somebody. Matter of fact, the only note that you made out there was you carry a little whip out book, don't you? Yes, sir, I do. Could we see that? Yes, sir. Okay. You had a book similar to that, did you? No, sir, I had this book. 
You had that particular book? Yes, sir. Okay. Did you, but you didn't note the time. Is that correct? Concerning the yard? Yes, sir. No, sir, I didn't. Now, I didn't have this book, or I don't know if I had this book or not. When you're talking about the experiment with the lights, I had this book on the night that I was dispatched to 5801 Eagle Drive. Oh, okay. But you went out there later on with respect to the experiment with the light. Yes, sir. That happened a day or two later? Something like that. Several days later, whatever? Yes, sir. You didn't make any notes at that time. You just relayed your information to someone there who was taking notes. Yes, sir. All right. Now, when you went to the backyard to search and secure the backyard area, the paramedics had gone in through the front door and were endeavoring to give aid to the children and to Miss Routier, weren't they? No, sir. When I exited the house to begin the search to go around to the backyard, the paramedics, we both arrived at the same time. I followed the ambulance in. When I exited the house to go around to the backyard, I told the paramedics that the scene was secured downstairs so that they could go in. Okay, I thought that's what I said. But when you left them and went to search the backyard, they went in, didn't they? Yes, sir. Okay, and administered whatever aid they could administer. Yes, sir. Now, you don't instruct them with respect to the crime scene, do you? In other words, you don't tell them, don't touch anything, don't do this or that and the next thing. They're in there. Their purpose is totally different from yours, is it not? Yes, sir, it is. Okay, and at points during, if they're in for an extended period or something, and I'm in there, I have in the past made comments to tell them to be careful about certain things, but that night, no, sir. Okay, so they went in, they were at leave to do whatever they deemed necessary. Yes, sir. They could move things, they could touch things, they could do whatever was necessary. Whatever. I And I would assume, and you were there, so I will just ask you, but I would assume that they would get blood on their hands. Would they not? Yes, sir, I would think so. I mean, it would be hard not to, wouldn't it? Yes, sir. You saw Darren Routier that night. He had blood on his hands, didn't he? No, sir, he didn't. Well, when I checked his hands at that time, he didn't have blood on his hands. Did he have blood on his hands later on? No, sir, I never saw him with blood on his hands. You never did? Are you sure about that? Yes, sir. Okay. I know he had blood on his shirt. Let's see. Give me just a second. I'm going to give you your report and let you refresh your memory. Okay. Did you refresh your memory before you came in here yesterday? With my reports? No, sir. Well, again, I don't know. But I would think that the purpose of making a report is so that later on, you can look at your report and refresh your memory from that report so that your testimony is as accurate as it can be. Yes, sir. That's correct. As you sit here right now, you're telling the jury, I don't know whether it's important or not, but you're telling the jury that Darren Routier did not have blood on his hands and palms when you looked at them. Well, now you're saying you're not sure. Well, I need to refer to my report. At this point, Mr. Mulder then says, would you mark this please? And whereupon the following uh, mentioned item was marked for identification only as Defendant's Exhibit 16. And Mr. Mulder then continues with his questioning. Let me hand you what's been marked for identification and record purposes as Defendant's Exhibit number 16. I'll direct your attention to this. Yes, sir. Did he have blood on his hands? Yes, sir. And on his shirt. Okay. I don't know that that's even important, but I mean, nobody has a perfect memory, do they? Well, I don't. All right, now I'm going to write down here, so we don't forget it again, that Darren Routier had blood on his hands and palms. Yes, sir, and on his shirt. All right, now after you searched the backyard and determined that the backyard was secure, you and Waddell then searched the upstairs. Is that right? 
yes, sir. And at that time, the paramedics were, and the firemen and all of those folks were beginning to arrive, were they not? Well, there was one ambulance unit that I followed in, and another one had been dispatched at that particular time. I'm not sure if the second ambulance was there yet or not. And I believe an engine was dispatched. And as we were going upstairs, I'm not sure if that one had arrived or not. Could you tell me again? I was at a vantage point where I couldn't see. But did you say that you parked over in this area? No, sir. You didn't park here, did you? No, sir. Okay, your partner was parked. See this vehicle where it looks like the mowing may have overlapped? Yes, sir. Do you see that stripe down there? Yes, sir. Your partner, or Waddell, was parked in this vicinity. Was he not? No, sir. He was on, I believe he was on the same side of the street that I was. Okay. Would you step down off the witness stand and with this marker, I don't want to mark up their exhibits, but if you'll mark on the overlay, if you'll just mark where Waddell was parked. Of course, part of your training is to observe those sort of things, isn't it? Waddell was parked there, right along in here. If you will, put a, all right, yes, sir. Will you show the jury where you were parked? Yes, sir. Okay. Anybody who thinks the second squad car was parked over here is just mistaken. Are they not? Mr. Greg Davis then uh, stands up and says, I'm going to object to that. It's comparison of testimony. And the court then says sustained Mr. Mulder then continues, at any rate, are you certain about this where you were parked? Yes, sir, I am. And you're certain about where Waddell was parked? Yes, sir. All right. And you're sure you were not parked over here? Yes, sir. And you're sure Waddell wasn't parked over here? Yes, sir. Okay. If you will, just take the witness stand again. Thank you. At which point he resumes the witness stand and questioning then continues. Do you have any idea, Lieutenant Walling, how many paramedics and police officers were in and out of that residence? I can tell you how many police officers were. Okay. And that's at what point? Well, I guess before you put up the tape and attempted to keep the scene, attempted to limit the contamination of the scene. Well, before six o'clock or around approximately six o'clock in the morning, myself and Officer David Waddell were the only two police officers that entered the residence. Of course, while you were checking the backyard, your main concern was to secure the backyard and not to count the paramedics going in and out of the house, isn't it? Yes, sir. And suffice it to say, you don't know how many paramedics were in and out of that house when you weren't there. Do you? No, sir. And you don't know what they did. Do you? No, sir. You don't know what conversations Darlie and her husband may have had with those paramedics. Do you? No, sir. All right. And if you're seeking medical information, it makes sense to talk to the paramedics as opposed to talking to the police officers, doesn't it? If you're seeking medical information. If who is? Anyone. Yes, sir. Okay, doesn't matter. I mean, me or the jury or anybody. I mean, if that's your choice, I would ask a paramedic. Yes, sir. Sure. Okay. You had, did you, was it your idea to set up a canvas? I mean, well, yes, that was one of the things that we were going to do. I didn't instruct the canvas to be done. It was another sergeant that instructed that the canvas be done. Okay, who was the sergeant that gave that instruction? Well, it might have also have been, I believe it was either Sergeant Ward or Lieutenant Grant. We all three were conversing and about the time when we were going to start that. And it was Sergeant Ward that delegated the officers to start the neighborhood canvas. Okay, and that would be in an effort to learn what any of the people in the neighborhood may have seen that was suspicious. Yes, sir. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Did they talk to, as far as you know, did they talk to all of the neighbors in the immediate area that is in this area? I don't know who exactly they did talk to. Okay. Have you had a chance to review those, the results of the canvas? No, sir. 
Let me ask you this. Did you go to the cemetery? Well, when the Routier children were buried? No, sir, I didn't. Do you know who did? No, sir. Okay. Y'all had people out there, though, didn't you? That went to the funeral? Yes. I know some people went to the funeral. Do you know if they videotaped the funeral? I don't know. I don't think. You don't know whether Rollett PD videotaped people coming and going from the funeral. I don't know if they did or not. If they did, they didn't discuss it with you? No, sir. Who would know that? Probably the lead investigator in the case, Jimmy Patterson. Jimmy Patterson would? Okay. Who else would know that? I don't know. Who was his lieutenant? His lieutenant was Lieutenant Grant. Lieutenant Grant Jack. Okay. I guess the lieutenant would know, wouldn't he? Yes, sir. I'm sure he would. That's something that you would clear with your lieutenant if you were somebody in Jimmy Patterson's position, isn't it? To go to the funeral and to videotape the people coming and going from the funeral. If they had decided to do that, I'm sure it was discussed. Okay, have you seen Patterson today? No, sir. You don't know whether he's here in town or not? Yes, sir, I do know he's here in town. He's here in town, but you just haven't seen him today. Yes, sir. When did he get in? Do you know? I believe they got in Monday night. All right. You have... Maybe I took it back from you. I showed you Defendant's Exhibit Number 16. It contained a Xeroxed page from a whip-out book. Yes, sir. Is that the only note that you took while you were out there at the scene? Yes, sir, it is. That's the only thing that you wrote down. Yes, sir. And do you remember what it said? Yes, sir. It said white male, dark colored ball cap, black t-shirt. Well, let me just give it to you so we don't have to. I don't want to split hairs with you, but exactly what you wrote down there. Okay. W slash M for white male, dark ball cap blue jeans, and BLK shirt. Would that be a black shirt? Yes, sir. Did you know whether that was a t-shirt or just a black shirt or a long-sleeved t-shirt shirt or just a black shirt? It was just a black shirt. That's all you knew at that time. Yes, sir. Okay. Now you had, and I think you testified yesterday, that you had a conversation with the with Darley. Is that correct? Yes, sir, I did. Okay. And that was not in the family room or in the kitchen or in the house, was it? No, sir. Well, no, sir. It was on the front porch. All right. It was on the front porch. And at that time, she was being attended to by the paramedics. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And they were getting ready to transport her to a hospital. Were they not? Yes, sir, they were. Okay. She had a severe gash to her neck. Did she not? She had a wound to her neck. Yes, sir. And did you see any other wounds on her? No, sir, I didn't. Okay. Anything to prevent you from seeing her arms? No, sir. Okay. But you're telling the jury that you saw no injury to either of her arms. Well, I don't recall if there was. I know she received some other injuries, but I don't recall where they were. Okay. But I think you said that she was extremely bloody. Yes, sir. Extremely. And was she hysterical? No, sir. Was she upset? Yes, sir. Understandably so? Yes, sir. Okay. Your conversation. You were asked, Lieutenant, under oath, how long your conversation with her took. Do you remember that? Remember what I was asked? whereupon the following mentioned item was marked for identification as defense exhibit number 15. Mr. Mulder then says, let me again. I'll favor you with defendant's exhibit number 15. I don't want the advantage on you and direct your attention to page 179. Yes, sir. Let me take this and get it out of your way. Do you have 179? Yes, sir, I do. 180? Yes, sir. And 181? 
Yes, sir. Okay. Do you see at the bottom line 24 of page 180 when you were under oath and you were asked approximately how long you talked with Mrs. Routier on that occasion? Line 24 on page 180. Oh, page 180. I'm sorry. Yes, sir. All right. No one suggested an answer to you, did they? No, sir. But you were asked how long on this occasion you talked to her. Is that right? Yes, sir. And what was your response then? And what is your response now? My actual conversation lasted less than 30 seconds. Less than 30 seconds. That's less than a half a minute. Yes, sir. Could have been 15 seconds. Could have been 20 seconds. It was less than 30 seconds. It was enough time to ask her as far as description goes. You had to get your whip out book and write it down, I assume. Yeah, I had it. Yes, sir. Okay. You were asked, Lieutenant, the substance of that conversation. Were you not? Well, line 10 on 180. Yes, sir. You said you had a conversation with her. You said it lasted less than 30 seconds and you were asked the substance of that conversation. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. And what was your answer under oath at that time? I had asked her for a description of the suspect. Okay. And did she give you one? Yes, sir. Okay. And do you recall what that was? White male, possibly wearing dark colored ball cap, black shirt, and blue jeans. Okay. If my watch is right, our exchange there took a little over approximately 25 seconds. Was that about the length of your conversation with her? No, sir. I also asked her what happened. Mm Mm-hmm. And? I understand that's what you said yesterday. But when you were asked, was there something you didn't understand about the question back in August? You were asked the substance of the conversation. Were you not? Yes, sir, I was. And that means in plain old ordinary English words, that means what did you talk about? Yes, sir. In this less than 30 second conversation, and you said, quote, I asked her for a description. Is that right? Yes, sir. And you didn't say any of this other stuff back then, did you? As far as asking her about what happened? Yes, sir. No, sir. You just forgot that back then? Yes, sir. Okay. That's when I was being asked. I thought I was being asked about, I'll accept forgot. I'm not here to Mr. Greg Davis then says, I'm sorry, please. Again, I've got to ask, we end these sidebar comments by Mr. Mulder. Mr. Mulder then says, I was talking to the witness. Mr. Davis then says, can I have a ruling, please? The court then says, gentlemen, sustained. And I'm not telling... And I'm telling both attorneys, no more sidebar. We're not going to put up with that. Let's ask the questions, get the answer, and no comments. Your next question, please. Mr. Mulder then resumes. The only substance was the description. Dark colored ball cap, black shirt, and blue jeans, and forgot other. Right? Is that fair? About when they asked me the last time? Yeah, when you were asked in August under oath. Yes, sir. About this less than 30 second conversation. Yes, sir. Okay. Actually, sir, I didn't forget the other. How the question was phrased. I didn't think that's that that's what at the time when I was thinking, you know, I didn't think that that's what what I was going into the rest of that. Oh, when they asked you the substance of the conversation. Do you understand? You understood at that time. That meant, what did you talk about? Didn't you? Well, I think I just misunderstood. Oh, now your explanation is that you misunderstood. Yes, sir. Did you misunderstand when you wrote your report initially? Was there something you misunderstood? No, sir. Did I misunderstand what? Well, you initially made a report about this incident, didn't you? Yes, sir, I did. Okay. And in the report you initially made, you were there for some time, weren't you, at the scene? Yes, sir. Okay. And I mean, if I had you list what you did step by step, and you probably did some 15 or 20 steps while you were there, 
Did you not? Different procedures and things? I would say 70 to 200 different steps or more. Okay, all right. So it would be easy to confuse somebody, I guess, as to what was step number 79 and what was step number 92. Yes, sir. I couldn't recall specifically the order that I did a lot of the things in. Okay, but I would think that everybody would remember the first thing they did when they got there, wouldn't you? Yes, sir. Okay, but you didn't, did you? Yes, sir. Oh, you did? Yes, sir. Okay. Didn't you tell the other folks out there that the first thing you did was go to the front door and get the information from Officer Waddell and then immediately exit and go to the back and check the backyard? No, sir. You didn't do that, did you? No, sir. We, and that you saw once you were in the backyard, that's when you saw the screen to the window was cut. No, sir. Okay. Let me hand you what's been marked for identification and record purposes as defendant's exhibit number 15. Yes, sir. What's the verdict? Well, as far as did you not, why don't you go ahead and read the second? I marked it for you so you can find it a little easier. Okay. Lieutenant, isn't it a fact that your first story was that you went to the door and talked to Waddell? No, sir. Briefly? No, sir exited immediately, went out and back, and it was from back here that you first noticed the garage. Yes, sir. I left out a step of checking the garage in that initial report. Left out the first step, didn't you? Well, the first step was talking to Officer Waddell. Okay, well, but instead of going back through the kitchen and into the garage and noticing the cut mark, do you want to read your report again I'll keep it up here if you want me, if you're going to be referring to it. Well, I don't need to refer to it. Okay. I mean, would you feel more comfortable if you had it up there with you? Well, if you let me ask questions that I am going to have to quote from it, I don't have it memorized. Well, the bottom line, the first story was that you came to the entry, made an, once you found out what had happened, you made an immediate exit, went around to the backyard, And it was from this point that you noticed the window, wasn't it? No, sir. That's not what it says. It's not? No, sir. Okay. It says, I went to the front door. And by that, I was referring to that's how I got in the house. Then it says, I went around and checked after conferring with Waddell. I went around and checked the backyard. I did leave out the step of going through and checking the garage on that initial report. It was made at around 11.30 a.m. that morning, and I had just been up over a little, over 24 hours that day, so I forgot. I forgot. All right. I left that step out. Yeah, you did. And in fact, your initial report, you don't say anything about going inside. You don't say anything about going back to the garage or anything here, do you? No, sir, I don't think there is. Matter of fact, in your initial report, you say that you noticed the cut screen from the backyard, don't you? Well, I don't say I noticed it for the first time there. Well, quote, once inside the yard, I observed a window on the south side of the garage open and that the nylon screen had cut open, had been cut open and two large slashes, unquote. Uh Uh-huh. Well, you're saying it here, are you not? I'm saying that I observed it from the garage and went back around and located which window it was from the backyard. Mr. Mulder then says, okay, I'm going to offer into evidence what has been marked and identified as defendant's exhibit number 14. Mr. Davis says no objection. The court says defense exhibit 14 is admitted. And then Mr. Mulder continues with his questioning. Suffice it to say, Lieutenant, there was a lot going on in a hurry out there, wasn't there? Yes, sir, there was. And even a trained police officer under fire can make some mistakes, can't he? Yes, sir. And none of our memories are perfect, are they? Mine's not. Okay. Mr. Mulder then says, I believe that's all that I have. And the court then says, Mr. Davis. And at this point, uh, Mr. Davis does his redirect examination. 
Lieutenant Walling, let me ask you, you had mentioned during your testimony that you were present during the testing of the security light of the backyard. Is that correct? Yes, sir, it is. And I believe you testified that your job that night was to determine how long that security light. The court then says, all right, gentlemen, no stage whispers, please. Thank you. We'll continue. Let's calm the stage whispers down. Mr. Davis, go ahead. Mr. Davis then says, yes, sir. Now, did you, in fact, on the date that you went out there to the residence, determine how long that security light would remain on once it was activated? Yes, sir. Could you tell the members of the jury how long that light will stay on once it's activated out there at 5801 Eagle Drive? Approximately 18 minutes. Okay. And it took you approximately how long from the time that you got that call that evening to the time that you entered the backyard. Was it less than 18 minutes? Yes, or a great deal less. Just a couple of questions about the interior of the house, the family room where the children were initially. Is that carpeted? Yes, sir. Okay. How about the flooring in the kitchen and the utility room? Are they also carpeted or do they have a different flooring? No, sir. It was a vinyl flooring. Some sort of linoleum? Yes, sir. During the time that you were having this conversation with the defendant on the porch, did you have any difficulty understanding what she was trying to say to you? No, sir, I didn't. Did it appear to you that she was having any problems understanding what information you wanted from her? No, sir. Was there any hesitation on her part in providing the information that you asked for out there on the porch? Well, no, sir, other than she was being seen by the paramedics and I was getting in when I could. Okay, you asked a question and she gave you the information. Yes, sir. The den, the family room that you went into initially, Lieutenant Walling, when you went back, did you go back into that room sometime after 6 a.m. with the crime scene team? Yes, sir. Lieutenant Walling. Let me use this pointer. Looking at state's exhibit number 11-B, do you recognize that to be a photograph of the family room? Yes, sir. Okay. There's an object up here toward the top of the photograph that appears to be sitting sort of between the sofa here and the big screen television. Do you see this, sir? Yes, sir, I do. What is that? It's a large metal cat cage. Okay. Now, when you went in there, to do the walkthrough of that residence, was there anything in that cage? There was a large cat. Did you have any opportunity that morning to go anywhere over there near this cat cage, sir? Yes, sir, I did. Tell the members of the jury what happened when you went over into the area of the room close to this cat cage. When I got within three to four feet from the cat, from the cage, The cat came to life and started bouncing off the walls, the sides of the cage. It scared me. Okay. I didn't know there was a cat in there at the time. Okay. When it was bouncing, could you hear it? Yes, sir. Mr. Greg Davis then says, I'll pass the witness, your honor. Mr. Mulder then says, I have just one last thing. At this point, Mr. Douglas Mulder, again, the defense attorney for Darley, does his recross. Is it your testimony today under oath that the only notes that you took out there that were in the whip out book page that I showed you, is it just a coincidence that these notes correspond with what you said under oath, the gist of your conversation was, or the substance of your conversation was in August? Is that just a coincidence? No. Mr. Mulder then says, Do you want me to ask that again? Mr. Greg Davis then says, ask that again, please. Mr. Mulder says, okay. You were asked the substance of your conversation and you said, quote, I asked for a description and she told me dark colored ball cap, black shirt and blue jeans. And the conversation lasted less than 30 seconds. Is it my question to you now? Is it just a coincidence that that corresponds with the notes that you took in your whip out book? Is that just a coincidence? Well, 
I mean, that's your whip out book. You didn't say any more at the time when you were asked the substance of the conversation and your whip out book doesn't show any more than that. Is that just a coincidence? If it is, I'll write it down. If it's not, well, is it a coincidence that I'm not quite sure that I follow you? I mean, is it a coincidence that I, at the time, that I didn't tell about my conversation with her about asking what had happened? Yes. Is that just a coincidence? No, I forgot that. Okay. And you forgot to make any notes of that too, didn't you? About what now? That you asked her anything else. You didn't make any other notes about that in your whip out book. No, those are the only notes I made. Yes, sir. In your whip out book. Yes, sir. Okay. Mr. Mulder then says, I believe that's all. And then again, Mr. Greg Davis comes up for his redirect again. Lieutenant Walling, just a couple of things. Do you recall Mr. Mulder asking you about whether in your initial report that you had noted that you had gone through the house with Officer Waddell to check the garage before exiting to go around to the backyard? Yes, sir, I do. Sir, in this case, did you prepare a supplemental report? Yes, sir, I did. Is that an unusual procedure? No, sir. Mr. Davis then asked me, I approach your honor. The court then says, you may. Let me show you one of the pages that was marked for identification purposes only as defendant's exhibit number 16. If you would, if you will re review the first paragraph of that supplemental report. Okay. First of all, when did you make this supplemental report? Do you recall? either a day or two later. The date will be on the second sheet. Okay. I believe it was two days later. All right. And let me just ask you whether or not in this supplemental report that you were, you prepared, let me just show you another. This is investigator supplemental report that may refresh your memory as to the date that you prepared the supplement. This is the first one. All right. That's the first one. Yes, sir. All right. So sometime after June, June 6th, you prepared a supplemental report, correct? Yes, sir. Tell the members of the jury whether or not in your supplemental report, whether or not you noted that you and Officer Waddell checked the garage for the suspect. Yes, sir. I did. Okay. And would you tell the members of the jury whether or not you noted in your supplemental report that you noticed the tear in the window screen as you were checking the garage before going outside. Yes, sir. That's what this supplemental report says. Isn't that the purpose of the supplemental report? Yes, sir. To correct anything that I might have forgot or got out of place. Okay. Mr. Greg Davis then says no further questions. Mr. Mulder says, I believe that's all we have to. Thank you. The court then says you may step down and then says your next witness the next witness that is supposed to be coming up to testify and which will be in the next episode is Sergeant Dean Poos, P-O-O-S. Sergeant Poos is a public information officer, communications and, and record supervisor and computer system administrator. And he will be up next in the next episode, as I stated. Before I give some of my observations here, I want to apologize because at the time that I'm doing this, there is significant construction noise going on around me. So I apologize for any bangs or anything you may hear in the background. I've done my best to take them out. Uh, anyway, just wanted to make you aware of that so you weren't shocked by the background noise, but I had to get this done. This is uh, taken far too long to get out there as it is. Okay, so I want to point out just a few things, uh, whether or not these are considered quote unquote opinions or not. These are just things that I kind of noticed as I went through this particular testimony. Uh, first of all, when Walling got to the house and he walked inside, the thing that really struck me was that he saw not only Darley and the other officer, uh, Waddell, but he and a child but he also saw Darren and Darley was standing behind Waddell, who, if you remember, was the first officer on the scene. 
Darren was standing beside her. Now, I'm going to have to go back and look at Waddell's testimony, but I don't recall this ever being pointed out as the fact that Darren was, in fact, beside Darley. And another thing that strikes me is that um, at this point, Darley is, in fact, on the phone. And if Darren were, in fact, standing beside her and had even simply murmured something, it would have been picked up on the 911 call. Secondly, um, Walling, when he was asked about how he got into the garage area when him and Waddell went to explore and look for this, this guy, he said that he had walked into the garage area on the side of the island opposite the sink. Okay, so that's where we're at. But in cross-examination, it was determined or it was found out that in his initial written report that he made the same day, once he was all done and he had gone back to the station and he wrote his report, he made no mention of walking through the kitchen into the garage. Uh, It kind of made it appear as though he walked in, he talked to Waddell, walked right back outside and then into the backyard. So this is kind of interesting. We'll just kind of have to see where it goes from here in further testimony. We're very, very early on. He did note a broken wine glass. And in this testimony, he did say that he saw a vacuum cleaner near the sink. And I know that this vacuum cleaner comes up in many instances. And this, I know it becomes very important. So Every time they bring up this vacuum cleaner, you might be wondering, what the hell are they talking about? Why is a vacuum cleaner important? Well, it does become important, at least in regards to some uh, photos that I have seen. So anyway, let's get back to what Walling had said. He said that he did say he saw a vacuum cleaner near the sink. But when the defense team was questioning him, he says he doesn't remember seeing it at the time or if he may have noticed it later during, quote-unquote, crime scene. And the defense refers to his prior testimony that he had given uh, back in August, where he states that he didn't recall seeing it. Now, maybe this is splitting hairs. You know, I don't remember seeing it. I don't recall seeing it. Nothing is ever really definitive. And you find this, at least so far, what I have found in the testimony is nothing is ever really thoroughly definitive um, unless it's written down, which, of course, many things evidently were not. During Waddell's, Officer One's, testimony, when he was speaking about walking into the garage after Walling, uh, when Walling finally showed up, He mentioned he didn't see anything like blood or blood supply, anything on the garage door. However, uh, Walling said that he did. He said he saw it near and around the handle on the side of the garage door that would face the kitchen. Now, let's go to the fact when they they're upstairs, right? They walk upstairs. They're checking the upstairs rooms for this potential intruder. And they walk into all of the different bedrooms, and one of them being one of the children's bedrooms. I will have a link for you in the show notes that shows uh, States Exhibit 17-C. And what this does is this shows a picture of one of the child's bedrooms. And in the testimony Moni, that Walling gives, he says that both beds were quote-unquote made up. So they're all made like there nobody slept in them or anything but in the photograph given by the state the bottom bunk is not it's a bit of a mess but maybe they'll get to why this is later on I don't know another thing that really struck me is that Waddell officer one in the previous testimony had said that after they cleared the upstairs they walked down the stairs And he said that the neighbor, Karen Neal, was standing at the bottom of the stairs. Now, in this testimony, Walling, he says nothing about Karen at the bottom of the stairs. Now, I don't think he was asked this directly, but 
The fact is, he never brings this up. He just simply says, hey, he walked down the stairs and directly outside and that he instructed Waddell at that point in time to stay at the front door and to not let anyone inside the crime scene. Now, my personal thought is, hey, this is great. They're at the front door. But so what? What about the back door? Who's guarding the back? Because obviously you could get into the unlocked gate, correct? So are they just leaving that wide open or are they just assuming that, hey, because we have the front covered and there's all these people in the family room that we're just not ever, um, if somebody does try, you know, to get in here for some reason, uh, we're going to see them. So I don't get that one. Another thing that kind of struck me was about his particular timeline and his being the officer number two that has just testified because he said that, okay, so he had walked outside. He had gone through first talked to Waddell and kind of got this information or whatever. They went and checked out the garage after a while, after he had gone through the upstairs and everything, he walks outside and says that he would, he strings up crime scene tape, right? He does this across the street. It, the tape runs from the house, the, um, Routier house all the way across the street and back. And he says that he did this about 10 minutes after arriving at the residence. But keep in mind that this was, he had arrived, he had walked in, he had gone through the garage, walked outside, walked around to the backyard, checked out the backyard, which he said took, takes about, you know, one to two minutes He comes back around, and I might be getting these a little bit mixed up, but nonetheless, he also speaks with Darlie at this point because she is sitting on the front step. So after he does all of this, and then he begins to, I guess, start to get ready to put the crime scene tape up, he sees this car come around the corner. He stops this car. He has everybody get out. He searches them. They search the car, blah, blah, blah. There is absolutely no way that he could have strung up the crime scene tape, which happened after he stopped the car, all within 10 minutes. I mean, this would be the car stopping, especially would have taken a considerable amount of time. Not to mention that he had actually, he had said that He had already been at the location around 10 to 30 minutes when he even saw the car. So I'm not getting where this uh, stringing the crime scene tape up about 10 minutes after he arrived at the residence is actually coming from. It just doesn't make any sense to me. And I had mentioned him talking to Darley because he did say at one point Darley was sitting on the front porch And he went up to um, talk to her for a quote unquote few minutes. Now, obviously, she had not yet been taken to the hospital or loaded into the ambulance. And he said that this conversation with Darley took place prior to him stopping the car. The only notes that he took during this conversation, quote unquote, with Darley was the description of the suspect. But he had said that he spoke with Darley for a few minutes. But then later, he said that the whole conversation that he had with her lasted about 30 seconds, just long enough to get the descriptive information about the intruder. Why this is interesting is that in his report, and I believe it was his supplemental report, not his initial report, his supplemental report said that during this conversation, uh, Darley told him that she had been awakened and felt someone standing over her. Uh, Then she realized she had been stabbed and began to struggle with the person. He said she told him that the struggle occurred at the couch, not between the kitchen and the family room. And she also specifically said it was a white male. Now, on cross-examination, he said, This whole conversation lasted about 30 seconds. In previous testimony in August, he never said that he had a conversation with Darlie about a struggle. Next, let's talk about the dog. Okay, because this I know will probably be coming up many or further on. It's got to. When 
Walling comes back. This is officer number two, the one we just heard from. When he comes into the residence after six o'clock that morning, at that point, it's being guarded at the front door by officer Steve Ferry. And this is the first time that he mentions the Routier's small dog that was barking. And they were, they wanted to get this dog out of the house. This is also when they brought the neighbor, Karen Neal, inside to get the dog. But my question is, so had this dog been here like the whole time? Was the dog barking then? How come nobody's mentioned this dog up until now? And just a couple of more things. I found it really interesting that in the family room, there was a cat cage with a evidently a very large cat inside of it. And when Walling approached it, the cat began, quote unquote, bouncing off the walls. And it scared him because he didn't know that a cat was in this cage. But wouldn't the cat have been there the whole time while the paramedics and the officers were there? And obviously... You know, the cat's not going to sleep through all that. So, you know, maybe we'll learn more about this later on. And the final thing that I want to mention is that it's interesting to me that both Waddell and Walling each made supplemental reports after writing their initial report. Now, maybe this isn't so strange. Maybe it is. We'll have to wait and see if anything comes of it in the rest of the trial. So with that being said... Those are my quote unquote opinions, or at least my my, uh, initial thoughts after going through this first read. I'm sure I'll have more as time goes on. And that'll do it for this episode. Thank you so much for listening. I find this whole trial just absolutely fascinating. Um, If you enjoy this podcast and you want to become a supporter along with extra perks, please, please consider becoming a Patreon. You can get to Patreon, uh, my link, by going to patreon.com forward slash beachhouse34. Or you can also get to the link just by visiting beachhouse34 podcast on Instagram and the link will be right there in the bio. So again, thank you so, so much. I look forward to continuing on with this trial testimony, not too far in the future. Thank you.